are in Hebrews chapter 13 and our text is from verse 1 down to verse number 6. Hebrews 13. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honourable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetous, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And we'll stop reading there tonight. One of the things that uh, we have looked at in the book of Hebrews is how often we have seen our Lord uh, being um, compared to various things in the Old Testament. And we, what we've seen as we've gone through the book of Hebrews, how that Jesus is better than uh, the angels, how that he's better than the prophets. He has a, a better priesthood. Uh, he represents a better sanctuary. Uh, he gives to us a better rest. So one of the key words we could say is that uh, there's a better uh, uh, um, truth to be had and beheld in the Lord Jesus Christ. As we come to chapter 13, we find that this, book, this chapter is quite practical and it helps us to um, apply what we've learned thus far and to kind of put into a, a practical outworking of our, of our faith. In fact, some people have thought that chapter 13 was kind of like a cover letter to uh, the book as a whole, where I don't think that was necessarily the case because of the benediction at the end. But just so it kind of sets a tone, if you like, for how people are to live a life that is better. And that better life can only be had in Christ. Um, in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, just leading up to the, uh, that love chapter in the Bible, chapter 13, uh, in chapter 12, this is what Paul wrote. In chapter 12, verse 31, he said, Covet the, uh, uh, earnestly the best gifts, and then he said, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So he's talking about a way that is far better than, you know, what man could devise by themselves. So I'll show you a more excellent way. And then when you look at chapter 13, and there we have the various descriptions of uh, love in action. And verse 13 of that chapter says, And now abideth faith and hope and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. And what Paul is saying there, saying that the way that we live our life is to be one that is governed by love, this is kind of what we have in this chapter where we see that our lives are to be governed by love. And so if you wanted a better way to live, it's going to be one that's going to be characterized by love. So this chapter, we could divide into three parts. We're just going to look at the first six verses tonight. But the first six verses has to do with our love to uh, to the brethren or to people. And then in verses 7 to 9, we see love in action as it submits to spiritual leadership. And then in verses 10 to verse 16, we see love in action as it has to do with our public worship. And then the final verses take the form of a, a conclusion and a benediction. But we'll see that, uh, not just tonight, but as we go through the end of this chapter, that we see that it shows to us a life that is going to be governed uh, by love. And so that's what we want to look at tonight as to how we can live the Christian life that is going to be governed by love. And there's four things that uh, stand out to us in our text tonight. So our, our loving Christian life will be seen firstly in our compassion. So you look at, again at verse 1. He says, let brotherly love continue, uh, be not forgetful to entertain strangers. And verse 3, remember them that are in bonds. So he's talking about there's an outworking of the love that we have towards others. And so there's a, and we will see as to how this is found in three different ways. Firstly, there's a compassion for the saints. Because he says, let brotherly love continue. 
Now, you know, one of the evidences of a person being born again is quite simply that they have a love for the brethren. Now, sometimes we look at our lives, we try and examine and see, do I, have a, do I really have saving faith? Well, one of the reasons why we can know that we have save, saving faith is quite simply because of the way that we, we love one another. Now, remember what Jesus said in, in, his, in, in John's Gospel. He said, uh, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, by the love that you have one to another. And so some people have looked upon this and said, this is the 11th commandment, that we're to love one another. Well, the, the fact of the matter is, is we are to love one another. And when someone has been born again, it is something that doesn't have to be kind of, you know, pretended in any way, conjured up in any way. It is something that is going to be naturally there. But in saying that, this aspect of loving the brethren has its difficulties because we're all so different. We've been brought together from, you know, different walks of life. We have different interests and so we're totally different people. But oftentimes we find that the bond that we have in the church is closer than the bond that you have even with your own physical family. So why is that? And, and of course, the, 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 the quick and easy answer is quite simply the fact that we have a common bond in Christ. That's the thing that really draws us together. But sometimes, if we're honest, we are difficult to get along with because of our difficulties. And somebody coined this phrase. They said it like this. They said that to, to dwell above with saints in love, that will indeed be glory. But to dwell below with saints we know, well, that's another story. <laughs> and that's, there's a lot of truth in that. But even though we're different, we, you know, the fact that we're part of the same body and have the same faith and love the same Lord, that is something that, that draws us together. So loving the brethren, and, uh, and of course it means loving the, the sister in as well, you know, so the love that we have for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ is something that should be the norm. And so in Second Peter, he said that uh, when he talks about the different virtues in chapter 1, he said, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. So we need to, this is something that we need to add to ourselves, if you like. And then in the same chapter, he goes on and says that we're to honor all men and love the brotherhood. And then again, in, in, in the first epistle of uh, Peter, he talks about uh, we have an unfeigned, so it's an unpretentious love. He says, see that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. So this is a love that, you know, is going to be, which is going to come naturally, if you like, because of our, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he encourages and says, make sure that it is going to be unfeigned. In other words, you know, without uh, pretense. And of course, uh, the Apostle John, he wrote uh, quite extensively as to how that we know that we're children of God because of the love that we have uh, one, one for another. And so in 1 John chapter 4, John said, if, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also uh, to love one another. In the same chapter of 1 John chapter 4, he said, If a man say, I love God, and hate his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And he said, he went on to say, In this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. So we, we find that there is a, a natural aspect to the fact that as brothers and sisters in Christ, because of our bond in, in Christ, that we, we love one another. And the encouraging thing is, is that when, when we love one another as we ought to, then God looks down, and we looked about the fact about how, how to have God's approval in our lives. Well, God is well pleased when we love one another. How, how sweet, how pleasant, the psalmist said, to, for brethren to dwell together in unity. And uh, so, you know, God, God loves it when we have a love and compassion one for another. So he talks about having a compassion for the saints. But then he goes on and he talks about having compassion to strangers. 
So this becomes somewhat more difficult because in verse 2 he says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. Now the word entertain has the idea, you know, it doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, get your guitar and start singing to them, but it has the idea of showing hospitality towards strangers. Now, we need to exercise a great deal of wisdom because that doesn't mean that you're just going to open your door to the first person that walks by your house. You, you don't know who you'd be, you'd be inviting into your home. But if you think about the context in which this has been written, um, in those days, uh, um, they might have had a, a traveling evangelist or a traveling preacher come to their town or come to their city, come to their church. And they would be encouraged to take that person into their home so that they have a place to lodge. So, but it would be somebody that they didn't necessarily know, but they would be encouraged to entertain that stranger who was a believer. Um, but in the broader sense, you know, we should be quite compassionate to people that we come across because you really don't know who you're dealing with and you don't know what their, their needs may be. Because he actually goes on to say, in, in verse 2, he says, For thereby some have entertained angels and aways. Now that's an interesting verse. <clears throat> I suspect that um, we know that angels are ministering spirits. And so you may well have come across a, a, an angel in your life, but not necessarily knowing it. You know, you might have had some... Uh, body minister to you in, in a way and not realize it, but it actually was a ministering spirit um, because you're an heir of salvation. Uh, and there may well have been times when you helped somebody that was in need uh, and it was you may be ministering to an angel. But it's not to say that it is a commonplace thing and it happens to everybody all of the time because notice the wording he says that some, it doesn't say that you will entertain angels, but it just says that some have. And the principle is here yeah, is that you don't know who you're going to minister to. And so you might entertain a stranger uh, and who knows who you're entertaining. And when you think about this, I, I think our, our minds automatically go back to uh, the Old Testament with Abraham and where Abraham had these three visitors. And we know that one was, uh, was God himself and there was two other angelic beings. We, so we know this of chapter 18 and then chapter 19, where the two angels went down uh, to, uh, to Sodom and Gomorrah. But, uh, but, but Abraham, unbeknownst to him, had uh, entertained strangers unawares. And so you and I need to show hospitality because we never know who it is that we're ministering to. And of course, the fact of the matter is, is that when whatever service we do, uh, if we're doing it in the name of the Lord, you know, we are, if you like, even serving the Lord with that. So in, in Matthew chapter 25, uh, this is what Jesus said um, in verse 35 to verse 40. He said, I was a hungered and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw with thee a hungered or and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? When saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch have you done it unto one of these, the, the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Let me tell you, that's a great encouragement, to be someone that's going to entertain a stranger. Because uh, you, you serve someone, and you minister to that person, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the idea is is that you are ministering unto the Lord. Specifically, this is talking about the nation of Israel during the tribulation period. But, uh, you, you know, you could come across somebody that uh, it might be an area of salvation and you minister to that person while you're ministering as if you are even to the Lord. So that should encourage us. In this world, it's so easy to kind of brush off people and their needs uh, and and. and you know, don't see our responsibility of helping. Uh, but where we can, we should. We need to exercise some wisdom, of course, but we need to have compassion to the saints, compassion to, to strangers. I like what Jude said. Uh, in Jude, he said, uh, and of some having compassion, making a difference. And we need to make a difference as we have compassion. 
And then the third way in which we uh, show our compassion is found in verse 3, and that has to do with those that are suffering. So he says, remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as, yourself, as being yourselves also in the body. So what the writer to the Hebrews is saying, listen, there are people that are suffering for the cause of Christ. And specifically, he's talking about people that are in bonds. They're imprisoned because of their faith in Christ. So if we think back in that day and hour, it wasn't an uncommon thing for people who were boldly proclaiming the name of Christ, boldly preaching uh, the way of salvation, that they would be that they would suffer and sometimes even be imprisoned for their faith. And so we, we read of this, don't we? We, we, we see uh, Peter and we see John uh, being imprisoned a couple of times. We see Paul uh, imprisoned numerous times. We, we see Silas being thrown into prison with him. In fact, when you look at all the apostles, all of the apostles suffered for Christ. In fact, all of them, except for the apostle John, died a martyr's death. And John, he died in, in exile on the Isle of Patmos. So they all knew what it was like to suffer. These Hebrew Christians are being encouraged to have compassion on those that are suffering. And so, you know, the Apostle Paul, he, he would write to Timothy and he would speak about the fact that they, people shouldn't be ashamed. Uh, you know, he, he says to Timothy, don't be ashamed of me, the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in the same chapter, he goes on and he praises uh, Onesiphorus uh, because he wasn't ashamed of his chain and he often re refreshed him. So what I'm saying to you tonight is these people had compassion on those that were suffering. And they had compassion on people that were suffering in, an, in a time when it was actually quite dangerous to show compassion to people that were you know, incarcerated because of their faith. Nero was on a rampage. He hated Christians. So you can imagine identifying yourself with Paul and, and Nero's, you know, burning Christians alive, throwing Christians uh, to wild animals, imprisoning people. It would be quite dangerous. But we find that we're not to be ashamed of their bonds and we need to identify ourselves with them uh, because of the fact they're not suffering for any fault of their own but they're suffering for the cause of Christ. So it's uh, quite an important thing to do and sometimes what we, we kind of lose sight of the fact of is that we think that this is th something that happened you know a long time ago but there are people even today that are suffering for Christ. I don't think we know the accurate figure but it would be thousands upon thousands of people today that suffer for the cause of Christ, that whose homes have been ransacked, whose families have been divided, whose uh, the, perhaps the pastor or the deacons or the preachers in the church have been taken and, and cast into prison because of their faith. And even people that perhaps weren't preaching the gospel but just based upon purely what they believed would be imprisoned. And we, we need to be mindful that these are people that need our compassion and they need our prayers as well. So if we're to be living our lives, if we're going to put into practice, if we're going to put shoes on our doctrine, here's the thing, we need to have compassion. So he talks about having compassion to the saints, to the strangers, and to those that are suffering. Then the second thing that he tells us is there needs to be something about our conduct. And again, our conduct is going to be... Um, controlled and governed by our Christian love. So look if you would at verse 4. So verse 4, he says, Marriage is honourable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So he says here that our, our lives are to, our, in our conduct is to be governed by love. So we see that there's to be... Uh, uh, the, the love inside the home and we need to make sure that we we protect it we, we've emphasized in verse 1 that of brotherly love now we see that in verse 4 that marital love is emphasized 
So in verse 4 here, we see that the, the clearest and the plainest teaching of the sanctity and the intimacy of marriage is presented for us. He says that uh, marriage is honourable and the bed's undefiled. So he talks about it is quite pure and honourable. Uh, in Intimacy is pure and honourable in the bounds of marriage. That's becoming more and more of a rarity today. But we need to see that our conduct is going to be governed by love and we're going to protect that uh, in the home. We must never lose sight of the fact that marriage is something that has been established by God and ordained by God. And in the wicked world in which we live today, we need to also emphasize that God established marriage to be between a man and between a woman. And so that is how God looks upon marriage, and that's exactly how we should. And he says that the bed is undefiled, and so that talks about that the, the natural affection within the home is something that is uh, not sinful and is not uh, perverted in any way. So love within the home should be something that is protected, and it should be something that is promoted. But then I like you to notice that he goes on, and he condemns the lust outside of the home. Because notice he says, But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So that's quite strong language. And it's actually interesting that this is God's terminology. So nowadays we would like to kind of tone it down somehow. But we should never seek to do that. Because God is talking and, and explaining sin for exactly what it is. And so outright God refers to these people as being whoremongers and adulterers. So we, we need to be governed by love. And of course, within the bounds of marriage, intimacy is a sacred gift. But outside of marriage, it takes something that is pure and uh, something that is uh, beautiful and takes it into something that is ugly and something that is sinful. So he says that uh, whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So that's telling us that there's going to be horrible consequences for those who abandon God's standard for love and marriage. God always judges sin. And sometimes, like we'll read of this in, in Romans chapter 1, we see how that God sometimes judges people in their own bodies. You think about all the various diseases that people have today. That is, they have a judgment upon them because of their wicked lifestyle. Then you can be sure of this, that at the great white throne judgment, there will be judgments meted out there. Now we know that believers can commit these sins as well. So we would understand that for the believer, there would be uh, a, you know, a chastisement right here and right now. And there also would be in the future... A, a loss of rewards. But the fact of the matter is, is that there's always a consequence because of sin. So you think of David, for instance, because sometimes you know, we, we look at the saints of old and we look at their sins and say, well, they kind of, they sinned and he, he was a godly man, a man after God's own heart, and people use it to excuse the way that they live. But think about David. And he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. And, uh, and God judged him. Now, of course, uh, he came to repentance and he asked God's forgiveness and he had God's forgiveness. And he was able to have once again sweet fellowship with God. But the consequences of his sin were something that would kind of dominate his life. And you think in, in the ways in which he was, was judged, it had to do with his wicked children. Solomon was the exception, but think about the difficulties that he would have with his children. And so, you know, God judged him because of his sin. And there's a consequence when uh, we disobey God. So our Christian love is going to be seen in our compassion. Christian love is going to be seen in our conduct with the love in the home and excluding lust outside of the home. And then... We uh, go to verse 5 and we see the third thing, how that um, our lives will be governed by love. And notice he talks about contentment. 
because he says in verse 5, he says, let your conversation, now again, that word conversation doesn't mean, you know, having a conversation like a talk, but it has to do with our way of life. But he says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we are to be content with what we have. So we're told that our lifestyle, when we govern by love, it, our, lifestyle, our lifestyle is to be one that is without covetousness. So somebody that is, is covetous, now this has to do with wanting, wanting more, you could say. We often think of it in terms of money, but it can be used just as equally in terms with uh, possessions. And of course, when you think about commandments, it tells us we're not to covet our neighbor's wife. So, you, you know, it's, it's wanting more, wanting what somebody else has. And somebody who is covetous, they always, you couldn't put a figure to it, they always want more. If they had a million pounds, they'd want another million. If they had a hundred million, they'd want another hundred million. You know, they never quite have enough. And, um, it, it, you know, it, they never will be satisfied. And in fact, Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes, he spoke about this in uh, chapter 5. And if you'd like to turn there, verse 10, and we'll read to verse 15. Ecclesiastes and chapter 5. He, and Ecclesiastes is an important book in the Bible. It's, it kind of gives us life from man's perspective when God is left out of it. And Solomon had everything. He had wisdom, he had possessions, he had wealth, and he had everything that heart could do, desire, and yet he would say vanity. And when you've got all that this world has to offer, when God is taken out of the equation, well, it's all nothingness. But this is what he says in verse 10. He says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. He that loveth abundance with increase, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with the eyes? The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether they eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. There is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, Namely, riches kept for the owners thereof to the hurt, but these riches perish by evil travail. And he begetteth a son, and there is nothing in his hand. As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labour, which he may carry away in his hand. So Solomon is saying that, you know, a person is never going to be satisfied. And he also talks about the fact that when a person dies, they're just going to leave whatever they have to somebody else. So you could think of somebody that's amassed a great fortune in the world. So you think of somebody like Steve Jobs of Apple fame and how many millions and billions of pounds or dollars he would have had. Well, how much people might say, how much did he leave? Well, he left it all. You know, you, you can't take it. It doesn't matter what you have, you can't take it with you. And so we're reminded of this that... Uh, a person that is covetous, they're going to they're going to leave this world in the same way they came into it. So naked they come in and naked uh, they go out. Look if you would in the book of Luke chapter 12. And Jesus spoke uh, a parable about a certain rich man. Luke chapter 12. And we'll read from verse 15. From verse 15 he says, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. That's an important verse. Our life isn't the sum total of all the things that we have. It isn't the money in the bank. It isn't the mansion on the hill. It isn't the, all the things that money can buy. A man's life doesn't consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. And then he spake a certain parable unto them in verse 16, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room 
where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. There's nothing wrong with a person having ambition, but to leave God out of the equation, to leave God out of their plans, where a person just labours just to be rich, to earn one more pound, to have one more deal, make one more bank deposit, all of those things are going to be in vain. Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 16, he said, what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So there's, a, there's the warning given as we go through life that we wouldn't be covetous. But the opposite of being covetous is that of being content. And so in the latter part of verse 5, he says, and be content with such things as you have. <clears throat> now this matter of contentment is one of those things that don't always come naturally. When you think about a child, and we were all there, and you, you were given things, toys, and you know things to play with, well, you never had enough. You always wanted more. In fact, if you were in a group of children, you wanted what they had. So contentment, our parents had to teach us contentment. And, and, and as we go through life, this aspect of being content with what we have is something that has to be taught. The Apostle Paul, he wrote, and, and he was the kind of person that he knew what it was like to, to suffer and, and not to suffer. He knew what it was like to, to be full of food and to have to fast. He, he was able to experience all of these things. But this is what he said in the book of Philippians. He said, I've learned that in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. So he learnt contentment. And we have to learn contentment as well. When, when we've bought that new thing that we must have, and then a few months down the line we tempted to get the next greatest must have, we need to teach ourselves to be content with what we have. That's something that is going to be learned as we go through life. And one of the greatest ways in which we can really learn uh, contentment is to understand what we have in Christ. This is the secret, if you like, to contentment. Because in 1 Timothy chapter 6, we, we read that godliness with contentment is great gain. And in, in our texture, we, what is connected to this aspect of contentment is where the, the writer says, he has said, I'll never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Now, now what we have in life, you know, it either tends to break down or rust or get stolen. Our money gets wings and flies away. But Jesus says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. That's something that we can just kind of rely on. And when we realize all that we have in Christ... That's where we recognize the true contentment, uh, where true contentment lies. lies. We ha all that we have it doesn't even begin to compare with all that we have in Christ. And so we can rest in that and be content in that fact. So we're encouraged that in our compassion and in our conduct and in our contentment, we're going to be governed by love. And then finally tonight, the last thing is quite closely connected to this contentment. And that has to do with courage. Because the next verse goes on to say, so that we may boldly so. And now this is connected to the matter of contentment. The fact that Jesus has said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. And so we have courage so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. That is a grand statement, isn't it? To be able to say, the Lord is my helper. So it doesn't matter what we go through in life, and sometimes we feel like we have to carry the world on our shoulders, 
We've got all sorts of difficulties. But here we have this promise. He says, the Lord is my helper. And Jesus has promised that I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So we shouldn't allow ourselves to be governed by fear. We can have great courage knowing that we always have the presence of the Lord. Somebody said this to D.L. Moody. They said that my favorite verse is Psalms 56 verse 3. And the verse says this. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. And D.L. Moody replied and said, well, I've got a better promise than that. And he quoted from Isaiah chapter 12 and said, I will trust and not be afraid. The fact of the matter is we can rest on both of those promises. Because if we're honest, there are times where we are fearful. And what time I am afraid, I will trust in him. But then we can also go through life with a, a heart full of courage and say, I will trust in him and I won't be afraid. So yes, we can actually rest on both of those promises. But that it gives to us a great deal of courage. All because of all that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. So the writer to the Hebrews, as he begins to conclude and wind down this great letter, he is telling them, let your lives be governed uh, by Christian love. Make, you know, make sure that you have compassion and uh, love the saints and love the strangers and, and love the people that are suffering. But have compassion. And then he says, make sure that in your conduct that you're going to have the right kind of love in your home. And don't allow yourself to lust after what the world uh, has. So he talks about our conduct being governed by our love. And then he, he speaks about the contentment that we can enjoy in Christ. And that gives to us a great deal of courage. So he's encouraging them. Uh, telling them, if you like, you know, the, all these great doctrinal truths. Put it into practice in your life and be governed uh, by Christian love. And may we be governed by uh, Christian love as well. May the things that we learn tonight in the Word of God... May they, you know, be put into practice in our daily walk with Christ. So may the Lord help us and encourage us as we seek to do that. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for your word and we are thankful, Lord, for the encouragement that we receive. Lord, we thank you that your word, while it, uh, we are taught strong doctrine and we love it and we love to be uh, taught these uh, important truths in the word of God, we're also thankful, Lord, that we are taught practical doctrine as well. And we are thankful that these are truths that uh, don't just build our intellect and build our faith. It helps us to live godly lives. And so, Father, help us to put these truths into practice. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you'd help us, that we would indeed be a people that will be uh, governed by uh, the love that we have for Christ and the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts. So we commit ourselves to you and we'll thank and praise you in Jesus' name.